Good morning, Evergreen. It's good to see all of you. We invite you to stand as we begin to worship together. God invites everyone to worship him. And he says in Isaiah 55, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's free, free wine, yeah. Why spend your money on food that doesn't give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me. You will eat what is good, and you will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. So we're going to do that this morning. Let's call on the Lord. Let's seek him with all that we are. Let's turn our ear to him together. And so let's sing and let's worship together with open hearts, ready to receive all that the Lord has for us. You guys ready to do that together? All right, let's do this together.
Cause Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Hallelujah. center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church. And every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you Jesus. Sing his name.
about you. It's always been about you, Lord. Every song, yes, Lord, be the center of our time together, Lord Jesus. Be exalted, O God, in the highest heavens. Let every heart, every tongue, every voice declare that you, Jesus, that you are King. Be the center of this church, be the center of our lives, King Jesus. Would you pour your spirit out on us, Lord? Thank you, Jesus. This morning we're going to sing a new song, and it's called Fresh Wind. And in Acts chapter 2, it says, Suddenly a sound like a rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they are. And sometimes we sing songs about the spirit and the wind and the rain. It can seem very poetical, but also kind of like, okay, but just like,
by saying, right here, Lord. Here, Lord. Pour your spirit out right here, Lord. If that's your heart today, then just point to your chest and say, right here, Lord. Pour your spirit out. Here I am, an open and willing vessel. And Father, I want to want you. And when I don't want you, I want to want you. Father, we are coming before you with an honest heart, knowing that you are, you are the destination. Relationship with you is the goal. Your presence is what we're after. And so, Father, remove the distractions. Bind up the wounds. Break down the walls that keep us from truly putting ourselves in a position to say right here, pour your spirit out. Lord, we receive whatever you want to do this morning. We make ourselves available to your presence and to your power, not only for ourselves, but for those around us, those in this room and watching online. God, would you do the things that only you can do? Would you get the glory for it? Would you transform hearts and minds? Would you heal the brokenhearted? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Wow. Can we celebrate Jesus and his goodness, being able to be in his presence this morning? Well, Evergreen, I didn't want that to stop, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I have some exciting news that I want to share before I invite you to turn and greet. And that has to do with our giving project that we had going on all March want to give you an update. For those of you who don't know, for the last eight years, we have partnered with Food for the Hungry in Guatemala, and we have um, done many sustainability and development community projects with a remote village called Chacalte. And this year, the project was building a computer lab or a building that would host uh, some laptops, um, a computer lab with some restrooms. And we aimed for a goal, which was $13,000, and we invited you to give an evergreen. We are astonished with your generosity because uh, we were able to raise $25,000 towards the cause. Isn't that amazing? And so the team here is, um, once again, grateful. We say thank you, evergreen. You continue to be a generous church, a church that's going to give of its time, talent, and treasure, not only here, not only near, but also far. And so we want to celebrate with you today. If you're watching online, we thank you. So turn to a neighbor and say, way to go, way to be generous, and that's how we're going to greet one another. Good morning, Evergreen. My name is Kayla, and an inviting church is a growing church, so we want to invite you into what's coming up in the life of our church. Exciting news! Spring small groups are starting this month. Small groups are the perfect way to meet new friends while growing in your relationship with God. Alpha, men's groups, women's groups, English and Spanish options, grief share group, pickleball group, young adults group, crafting group, women's adventure group. There's a group for everyone. Bring your friend, your sibling, maybe even grandma. Visit our small groups wall in the back of the auditorium or the website to see what's available and to register. P.S. If you're registering for Alpha or Grief Share, be sure to register ASAP to save your place and RSVP for Kid Care. Registration closes April 10th. Y'all, it's almost time for summer camp! 
counts. eKids Camp Registration opens Sunday, April 28th at the Summer Jam booth in the lobby. You can register at the booth or online at ecc4.org once registration opens. This year, we are offering two amazing eKids Camp experiences. Summer Jam for kids entering first through entering fourth grade and Summer Jam X special experience for entering 5th and entering 6th graders. We want to give kids the best experience ever, so we want you to consider being a part of our Summer Jam crew. Youth Camp is July 19th through the 23rd for students entering 7th grade through graduated seniors in the fall. And registration opens next week on April 14th. You can register next week through our website, ecc4.org. Email Mikhail at ecc4.org if you have any questions. If it's not your season to send a student to camp, please consider giving a financial gift to make it possible for students to go to camp who would otherwise not be able to. Thank you for your generosity and investment in the next generation. You know her, you love her. Put your hands together for our speaker, Ilsian. Good morning. Good morning. You know, one of the memories that was triggered by the preparation of this message was when I would go to church with my mom, and in her church, it was a Spanish-speaking church, and they would have this practice where the leader or the pastor or whoever, they would say, Dios es bueno, which means God is good, and then people would respond all the time. And then they would say, Y todo el tiempo, and then they would respond again, Dios es bueno. And so I thought today that we'd give that a go, okay? I'm going to say God is good, and then you're going to say all the time. Okay, here we go. That was just practice. That doesn't count. Um, God is good? All the time. And all the time? And if you are watching us online, go ahead and type it in the comments. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. See, to me at that moment um, at my mom's church as a kid, that saying was a ritual of sorts, right, is what we did. But as I've grown up, I realized that it is a bold statement to confess in the context of my life. See, God is good all the time, but what about the time when sexual abuse violated my innocence? What about the times that alcohol and substance abuse that I witnessed turn to rage and violence in the not-so-safety of my home? What about the time I prayed that there would be a heartbeat and none was found? What about the time that gossip and slander caused emotional pain and rupture in my relationships? What about the time I experienced the loss of a friend taken too young because of a drunk driver? And the list could persist, but I will save it for my therapist <laughs> and save you the further discomfort. Because there is something, but hearing stuff like that makes us uncomfortable, right? It brings about discomfort. And I am sure that you too have a similar or maybe even more complex list of evil that has brought about much suffering for you. Lord, if only you had been here brother would have not died. The grief, the unmet expectation, the disappointment in that statement. This is the declaration of two grieving sisters at the loss of their beloved brother Lazarus. See, their story is recorded in the account of John, chapter 11, verses 21 and 32b. Both Mary and Martha ask the same question. And it's a familiar echo heard of humanity that goes something like this. God, why did you let it happen? For God, where were you when? 
and you can fill in the blank. Jesus' question, while experiencing insufferable pain, has a similar resonance. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The biggie, or the question we are wrestling with today, is how can a loving God allow pain and suffering? A question that a gentleman in his 60th decade of life that I had just met confronted me with after he learned about my faith in God. But as I listened to his combative tone, I could hear the pain. And it made me wonder, how did you arrive at this conclusion? See, there are very different conclusions people can arrive at after experiencing the hard stuff of life. The hard stuff of life will tempt me and will tempt you to conclude that God is not good. He must not be good. That there is no way that a loving God would let bad things happen. Or perhaps that God is not God. See, in his book, Night, by Eliezer Wiesel, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, reflects upon his horrendous first night in the concentration camp, and he says this, never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget those flames which consume my faith forever. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things, even if I am condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. Aren't you glad you came to church today? See, the great evil that he experienced led him to assume that God was no more. What does your perspective of pain, suffering, and evil lead you to conclude or maybe has led you to conclude? See, yet there were others. There are others that saw the same sight and came out with their faith in God that came out in open homes of restoration and restorative care for those that have gone through great suffering. It truly is a mystery how we respond to pain and suffering. And I wish I could give you one answer, but there isn't one answer. Because it truly is a mystery. But our perspective will be influenced by the narratives we tell ourselves and the narratives that the world consists of. In the third century BC, the ancient Greek philosopher, and I'm probably not gonna pronounce his name correctly like most of my life, Epicurus, hopefully that's right, asked, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. The philosopher presented this narrative to humanity that God must not be good or loving, that this was his justification why one shouldn't believe in a good God or a God at all. See, we all have narratives that we tell ourselves, that we experience, see or hear, especially in the face of suffering, a perspective by which we see and judge what happens to us, our loved ones, and our world. Have you ever doubted the goodness of God? Because if you have, congratulations, you're human. I think if we're honest, we have, I have, and I want to tell you today that it's okay to bring your doubts with you when you come to church. But see, I remember the very first time I read this um, story, and it's written, and it was told, actually, by this prophet. 
a prophet was someone that would speak on behalf of God. Um, and this prophet, Isaiah, he wrote this. And I remember the first time I, wrote, I read this, I was like, wait, 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 what? In verse 10 of chapter 53, it says, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Now, this is talking about Jesus. And it's saying that it was the Lord's good plan to crush Jesus and to cause Jesus grief. That his life is made an offering for sin. And if we continue to read all the suffering that Jesus endured, that he is writing about, it hasn't happened yet, but it is written, it will happen. And we celebrated last Sunday, right, how that story ends. But he sa- it says in Isaiah 53, it says he, in three, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we would be whole. He was whipped so we would be healed. And this is the wonderful, good plan of God. But see, if we read that his good plan is about grief and crushing out of the context of the God story, we grow disillusioned with a God that would do such a thing. But if we read it in the context of realizing that death is not the end of the story, that there is more, that because of God, Jesus entered our pain and our suffering. He entered our world. He was given for us because God loved. Because he loved. It was his good plan. And then I also read and I, about this guy, Asaph. And Asaph, he was uh, like a worship leader. He was the founder of one of the temple choirs under King David, who in writing Psalm 73, he provides a very honest revelation of his perspective. And he shows us this, that God challenges our interpretation of things. See, he says, In verse 1, truly God is good, right? There it is again. God is good, and he plans good. He says, God is good to Israel and for those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. And I could just picture it now. He's looking at their six-pack abs and just hating on them, you know? (laughs) At least I would be. Anyway, um, they don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. Look at these wicked people enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper. And this is what I want to say about this question. that we all need to wrestle with this question. And I want to encourage you not to be so quick to jump to a conclusion or an answer. 
not to wrestle with the question. I love that this guy said, you know what Asaph said? I really want to try to understand this. I want to try to understand what, what I see, the injustice I am looking at. I want to try to understand it. And so he does this, verse 17. It says that, then I went into your sanctuary, O God. And I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. Then I realized that my heart was bitter and torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant, yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. And this is his conclusion. My flesh and my heart may fail. Is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And he says, how good it is to be near God. See, nothing reveals who we are and how we really see God like these unwanted companions, pain and suffering. It is in Asaph trying to understand, trying to wrestle with what he sees, the injustice, this experience of pain that he says he wakes up to every morning that leads him to the sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary in the Bible was meant for personal communion with God. It was a place where God could minister to his people, meaning a place where he can care, he can comfort, where he can nurse, where he can tend his people with his presence. And it was in entering this place with God, and maybe for you, this place <clears throat> looks like prayer. Maybe for you, this praise looks like joining in singing with the worship songs. Maybe for you, this place is crying. Maybe it's journaling, or maybe it's just sitting in silence. <clears throat> maybe it's a walk in nature. But it was in that place, in the presence of God, that Asaph caught a glimpse of how bitter and torn his heart really was because of what his perspective had been. It was there that he realized the emotional mess that was going on inside of him. He received a revelation of his ignorance, but more so, it was in being in communion with God that he realized, I still belong to you. You, God, are the one that's holding my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. He valued the nearness of God, and that's why this language is used of, you hold me by my right hand. God, you are so close. You are so near to me right now. And then he says, you are leading me to a glorious destiny. I know that what I see, that what I experience, this is not the whole story. This is not where it ends. There is a glorious destiny. There is a future because of what Jesus did, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because God so loved the world you and I know that this story does not end in death. But there could be hope beyond the pain and suffering that we experience. But I want to remind you that in your narrative and in your perspective of pain and suffering, you can deal God your doubt. Yeah, deal it to him. All the doubt. Like a deck of cards. I'm really bad at that. But, you know, just deal it. Grab a second deck if you want and just keep on dealing your doubt to God. Because one thing I know is that he is not intimidated by it. That he can take it. That 
We are to be honest with him and ourselves about what we are feeling. So be honest with them. Be honest with yourself. What are you feeling? What have you seen? What has your perspective? What is that narrative being told in your head that has kept your perspective in one thing, in one place? And compare and contrast. And bringing it to him and being honest and letting him know, man, this is how I really feel. You can be straight up with him. And see, I think this is what I love about the story of John 11, where the sisters are straight up with him. They're like, I expected you to show up, Jesus, days ago when I first sent the message. But now my brother's dead. But had you been here, had you been here, it would be different. See, and at the beginning of chapter 11 of John, the sisters send the word to Jesus to come. And they said, our brother Lazarus, he is sick. They said, your dear friend is a very sick. They, they put that adjective in because they really wanted to convey the part that, man, we really need you, like very sick, like come on, Jesus. But the story goes on to say that Jesus gets the message but stayed where he was for two more Verse 17, it says that by the time Jesus arrived in Bethany, Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. And maybe the thought that comes to mind is, too little, too late, Jesus. But see, that conclusion reached without the context or skipping the part in the story where Jesus says, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved, and I love that, loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. And that's a very important detail that they put in there. Jesus loved. And I think sometimes... <clears throat> Pain and suffering really puts us in a place where we doubt, really, do you love me? But I love that this story says that Jesus loved them. But despite his love, he stayed where he was. And in response to Mary's reprise of if only you had been there, the narrative says that when Jesus saw her weeping, and saw the other people wailing with her, he was deeply troubled. Then Jesus wept. If you ever wanted to memorize the scripture that is the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. There you go. Now you know one verse by memory. But Jesus wept. And this is what I can observe from this story and the countless others stories in the Bible that God hurts with you in your suffering. See, I grew up in a religious environment that too often said that if I grieved, it was because I was not trusting God. That we're supposed to rejoice that it was not okay to be sad over the hard stuff in life. I remember freshly, like the week after I had broken up with this guy that I had dated for two years who I thought I was going to marry, like my heart was shattered into pieces, and I was told, get over it. I was like, oh, never coming back here again. No, I'm kidding. Um, but it was really hard to hear that. And I want to remind you that suffering people need to be able to weep. Can we make space for people to cry? Tears are healing. And I know that God understands the language of tears. So can we allow people 
to weep and be okay with it. And see, <clears throat> there are countless stories where, where I see God entering into our pain as well. There is the story. It is written in the Old Testament, and they are under Babylonian rule, and there are three guys who refuse to bow down to worship to the God that they have um, brought up and said, everybody needs to bow down to this God. And these guys are like, no, 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 we only have one God that we're going to bow down to, so we're not going to bow down. They're like, okay, if you don't do it, you're going to get thrown into the fiery furnace. And these guys are like, you know what? God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're still going to stick to what we know and believe of him. To me, that's so wild. Because the truth is, I wonder if I would be courageous enough in the midst of a fiery furnace to say, okay, God, I'll trust that you're going to save me, but if you, even if you don't, then I've lived a good life. And I'm going to jump in that fire, trusting that I know that I'll spend my eternity with you. And I don't, I don't know if we'll ever be presented with such a thing in our lives of like our faith truly being tested to the point where if you don't believe in God or if you don't reject or refuse God, then you are going to this fiery furnace. I don't know in my lifetime if my faith will be challenged in this way. But these guys, these guys, they, they, they trusted God even if you don't save us, God. And they're thrown in. All bound, they're thrown in the fire. And the king looks in and you know what he sees? He sees a fourth man in the fire. There is a fourth man in the fire and he says he looks like a god. And a lot of um, a lot of study, study and scholars say, you know what? That was Jesus in the fire with these men. And that is another part of the story that we get to see that God enters into our suffering, that God hurts with us. And that is why Jesus came to enter into our world, knowing that our world was a broken and that our world was full of suffering. That is why he is described in Isaiah 53 as the suffering servant. He entered in men of sorrows acquainted with grief. Jesus entered our world because of God's good plan. And friend, I want to remind you, that his good plan doesn't end with death. And see, if you continue to read chapter 11 of John, you see that Jesus resurrects Lazarus. And I think that's the kind of ending we all want. We all want for our loved ones not to die. And maybe physically, we don't get to see that. But guess what? Our hope it's not just the eternal earthly things. Our hope goes, transcends, goes beyond that. And our hope can be placed in Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. That is why we celebrated big last Sunday. Because his resurrection gives us hope in the midst of suffering and pain. God is not only able, but he is willing. And he has a good plan for you. And yes, sometimes the plan doesn't make sense to us. But can I encourage you to do what Asaph did when what you're seeing and what you're experiencing doesn't make sense? 
instead of trying to understand with her finite minds the infinite goodness of God, we enter into his presence. Or can we do what Mary and Martha did and said, you know what, Jesus, we need Jesus. Let me go to Jesus with my complaint. Let me go to Jesus with what I think he should have done, but he didn't do. And I love that Mary, she falls at the feet of Jesus and then says, had you been here? But Jesus' response isn't to reprimand or correct her. Jesus' response is to cry with her. So I want to invite you, as we respond to this message today, that you would grab your communion, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And as we take communion today, I want to give you some time to really enter into a place of communion with God. Maybe for you that means you need to close your eyes so you're not distracted. Or maybe for you it means um, you raise your hands. Or maybe it means you fold your hands. Or maybe it just means you're just sitting there. Or maybe it's a different physical posture that I've not named. But would you be intentional about your communion with God this morning? We celebrate communion to remember Jesus and his sacrifice for us. to say thank you, God, for your good plan. So, Lord, I pray right now with everybody coming to this place. Of entering into your presence. We know that you're always with us. Sometimes we are not aware or we don't intentionally come to you. So, Lord, we want to take this time. And, Lord, I pray for those that have been aroused by pain. Those whose suffering has brought on doubt, and questioning and Lord I pray that they would be able to come to you and at your feet say okay Lord this is what I'm seeing will you show me where my heart needs to turn to you will you show me where I need to invite you in So, Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, comfort those that are needed of comfort. Lord, give courage to those that feel so weak right now. Provide your strength. Minister your strength. Lord, minister hope to those that are living the good Friday of their lives right now. Lord, give us a perspective beyond the darkness of the moment to see the hope of the resurrection. That we would know that our story, your story for us, doesn't end in death because of what Jesus did so thank you Jesus that your body was given so that we would be made whole thank you 
that your blood was poured out and that the wages of our sin you took on that cross. Lord, if there are moments and areas in our life where we're walking our own way, help us turn to you. Help us repent. Turn back to you, God. And to live in the hope of the resurrection. So, Father, thank you. I'm going to invite you to peel the first layer take the wafer that represents the body of Jesus and say thank you God for hope for comfort or whatever it is that the Lord is providing for you right now would you thank him for that and as you do that I'm going to invite you to partake of his body layer of the cup Lord we lift up this cup and we thank you for the blood that was shed for us your blood that has cleansed us your blood that brings freedom your blood that was poured out Take of the cup. I want to invite you to just stay in communion with God for a bit longer as we sing this next song. You're invited to sing. You can stand. You can sit. You can kneel. But I just want you to respond to God's presence as we sing this song. Spirit. 
that is our prayer, that we would get to experience the power of your presence in every season of our life, but especially in the seasons that are filled with the really hard stuff. Lord, let us trust you and let us remain people of hope, knowing the dev is not the end of the story. Thank you, Jesus. Can we say thank you, Jesus? Do you stand right where you are? We are so glad that you joined us this morning. And I just wanted to say if you're here and maybe you are um, walking in and you're like, I want to find out more information about this person, Jesus, we would love to continue that conversation. So we encourage you, if that's you, there is a connection card in the seat pocket in front of you. Take it, fill it out, let us know. Just put on there, hook me up with Jesus, and we can talk about it, okay? But we would love to invite you to that. We're grateful for you. And church, remember that it is his presence that changes us and changes our world and our perspective. So thank you so much for being with us today. Be blessed. We love you. Happy Sunday. Kiddos are over there.